Welcome back to Inventive Problem Solving in Biomedical Engineering. Today's lecture is titled Invention by Repurposing, also known as Recycle Design. In the previous course, I once referred to this as product cannibalization. On Google, you'll find relevant topics under the keywords creative reuse, transforming trash into treasure. And I also like to link this to a favorite topic of mine, do-it-yourself medical device design. Let's have a look. Let's start with this definition, makeshift, a term you may have heard before. As a noun, it refers to a temporary or expedient substitute for something else. As an adjective, it means suitable as a temporary or expedient substitute. For example, use the rock as a makeshift hammer. Synonyms include stopgap, temporary, provisional, improvised, ad hoc, jury rigged, jerry built, cobbled together. The term has actually existed for many hundreds of years. It peaked sometime in around the mid 1900s and it persists today. Let's illustrate with this survival scenario. The bad news is your plane has just crashed. The good news is that you survived, the life rafts and the seat cushions have been deployed, but after several days you're washed ashore to a deserted island. It's cold and it's rainy. How would you create a temporary shelter to protect you from the elements until help arrives? Well, you would start by looking for resources, and you would cobble together or jerry-rig some kind of shelter that would protect you from the elements, from the sun, from the rain using whatever you could find. If those of you in the scouts may have learned how to do this using pine branches and uh, twine. And you can imagine, depending on the situation, that a number of different resources could be used to create a jerry-rigged or makeshift shelter. That was a hypothetical situation. Here's a real-life situation in which Entire groups of people may be displaced due to government insurrection or war or any number of um, adverse events. It's not a pleasant or ideal situation, but it illustrates human ingenuity in the light of adversity using resources to provide solution to shelter. When you think about it, every time we use a tool, we're basically repurposing something to solve a problem or perform a useful function. It's in our DNA. We've all seen examples throughout the animal kingdom. For example, these otters are using rocks to break open clam shells. This very clever crow has figured out a way of using this wire to extract a worm out of this glass tube. And what's most astonishing is the crow figured out that they have to bend a hook in the wire to turn it into a tool. It's really astonishing. Do you remember George Washington Carver from history class? Do you remember his claim to fame? It was turning the peanut into a hundred different products. And if you've ever looked at those products, it's really astonishing the diversity of things that he was able to fashion out of a peanut. Not only that, you may not know that he also did the same thing for the sweet potato, creating things like dyes, candies, and breakfast foods, and flowers, molasses, vinegar, even coffee. It's an illustration of resourcefulness, of using a resource, recognizing its component elemental value, and then repurposing it, or reconstituting it, or extracting from it useful functions, and then using them for another useful purpose. Reflecting back on lesson two, when we first introduced resources, we listed a number of different categories and we went through them rather quickly. But you may have noticed amongst the category of substances was this resource called waste. And this is really the topic of today's lecture, of repurposing something that otherwise is thrown away, is considered valueless, and giving it some value, giving it a new purpose. Here's a very interesting makeshift home. It's fashioned from a passenger airplane. Joanne Usury, a hairdresser, lost her last house to a fire. She was looking for a new mobile home to put next to the lake 
when her brother-in-law, an air traffic controller, had an unorthodox suggestion. She paid $2,000 for a 727 fuselage, $4,000 for a house-moving company to move it to her lot, six months, and $25,000 to renovate it. The resulting house had some unusual features, but it was built to last. The original airplane fold-down stairs were kept and were operated by a garage door opener, and one of the original airplane restrooms still works as it always did, and the cockpit is suspended over the lake below. You think that this is an unusual solution? Here's another one that happens to be particularly nice. In fact, it's actually a two-bedroom hotel suite constructed from a 1965 727 fuselage. And you can see it has a nice wooden deck, very nice paneled interior bedroom, and a very nice locale. When I went to college, there was a competition known as the Anything That Can Float Boat Race. The rules of the competition precluded you from spending more than $20 on supplies. And they required that you fashion some kind of craft that would float, propel you across the Hudson River and back. I'll spare you the story of the demise of the craft that my roommate and I had made. But the message was that there was numerous different solutions to the problem in which water bottles and inner tubes and children's swimming pools and uh, beer kegs were all used for flotation and all sorts of clever devices and repurposed uh, instruments used for propulsion. And here's a real life example from a low resource setting. Believe it or not, it's more common than you would imagine. Here's another example of an actual aircraft based home. In Pittsburgh, there's a small company known as Little Earth. They've been around for a while and their claim to fame was repurposing old license plates into handbags and all kinds of other accessories. More recently, they started using seat belts as part of their product line. They still exist today. You can see them uh, from time to time in various craft stores around town and elsewhere. Here's an example of some different kinds of furniture made out of PVC pipe, an old shopping cart, even a bathtub. You may have seen at the craft shows the use of circuit boards as uh, jewelry and other kinds of accessories. In Brazil, they've taken the concept to a whole other level. The catadores, as they're known, in the city of Belo Horizonte, sift through old garbage dumps and find treasures that they can turn into jewelry, works of art, and the like, which they can sell at nearby shops. They're recently featured in CNN. Another example that might be familiar to you is using something like an old shipping pallet to create furniture or a bookshelf. Here's an example of a bookshelf made out of an old piano and a waterfall. And here's an idea of what you can do with that old TV set that's been cluttering up your basement. And here are some ideas of what to do with that old PC and mouse that you don't know what to do with. And last but not least, this is about all some PCs are good for. While researching for this class, I found a number of clever examples that I'd like to share with you. Let's say you have a power outage and you find yourself without any batteries for your flashlight or there's no candles in your apartment. What could you possibly burn safely to produce temporary light. Interestingly, I did not know this, you can actually burn a crayon and it'll provide light for about 30 minutes. Here's another puzzler. Have you ever tried to fill a bucket from an undersized sink? It's really awkward. You have to tip the bucket and you can never fill the entire bucket. Can you think of a clever way to get the water from the sink to the bucket? And here's a hint, using a mediator and recognizing that you have gravity and the sink as resources. Well, here's a clever solution. is using a dustpan as a kind of funnel waterfall that can cascade the water from the sink into the bucket on the floor.
another couple of examples of things that you would otherwise discard that you could possibly turn into a useful function. For those of you that have ever painted anything, you know that after you dip your brush into the can, you have to wipe it in order to remove the excess. But the problem is the can is curved and the brush is flat, so it doesn't remove the paint evenly. Secondly, you get inevitably an excess of paint in the rim of the can that builds up and drips over the side and makes a mess. So here's a clever little solution that involves nothing but a simple rubber band stretched across the middle of the can that acts as a squeegee for your paintbrush. Why didn't I think of that? Okay, a couple of other examples that were found by students of previous years. Just recycling things around the house that you can use for a new purpose. This is a whimsical example of things that you can do with discarded cans. There's lots of them on the internet, and these are a couple I thought were particularly clever. Or for that matter, useful things that you can make out of bottles. What can you make with a tennis ball? I'm sure you've seen walkers that have these tennis balls that they attach to use as a skid. What else can you make? Well, I found a couple of examples on the internet. Here's a set of ear protectors. And here's a type of mail and key and pen holder. And this is something really ridiculous. But if you think about it, tennis balls are rather versatile piece of raw material. I bet you, you can think of some other clever things that you could possibly make out of a tennis ball. This may not be the most monumental invention of all time, but I really respect the ingenuity of the person that thought of taking two coffee cups, nesting them, and then using it as a kind of timer or indicator of what time the coffee was made. And of course the inventive principle is obvious. It's one of our favorites. Number seven, nesting. Here's a very clever and non-obvious thing that you could do with a plastic bottle to turn it into a broom. I'm going to have you think of other things you can do with bottles. Like the tennis ball, it's a very versatile piece of raw materials, so we'll play with this idea in class. Here's just one example that's very clever you maybe never thought of unless you've seen it before. Separating egg yolks. This is the way most people do it. They crack open the egg. They flip the yolk back and forth until the white spills out. Well, you can use a discarded bottle in this fashion to basically suck the egg yolk out of the egg white. You suck it into the bottle and then you transfer it into another plate. So it's using a couple of inventive principles, which I find really intriguing. I'm sharing this example because it reminds me of situation that I encountered many years ago as an undergraduate where I had to polish a piece of copper and I had no copper polish and I asked the machine shop that I was working for for a suggestion and he said use toothpaste never occurred to me well this is a little hint for polishing really anything that's plastic this in this case it's a, a car headlight uh, that's become hazy so you can literally use toothpaste with a toothbrush or a soft cloth as a type of glass polish or plastic polish. Here's a wrapping paper anti-unraveler, as I call it. Most people have rolls of leftover wrapping paper, usually either unraveling or they might use a piece of tape or a rubber band or paper clip. But here's a clever reuse of a toilet paper roll that is just cut open along its length and creates a kind of collar that holds the paper together using Inventive Principle 7, nesting, and Inventive Principle 14, spheroidicity. Here's another first world problem I apologize, but it's a good one. It's about these little slivers of soap that wind up in your soap dish. What do you do with them? You could throw them away, but it's kind of wasteful, and to use them the way they are is almost impossible. How about combining that little sliver of soap with a full bar of soap? so that it can actually be used. I like this example because it's a perfect case of converting harm into a benefit. I cut and paste directly from the manual so you can see 22B. Remove a harmful factor by adding it with another harmful factor. And likewise, if you were to store up a whole bunch of these little harmful factors and combine them, you could make them into a whole brand new 
albeit multicolored, multi-smellular a bar of soap. Is that a word? One last first world problem really quick, the problem of removing that pesky stem from the top of the strawberry. You know, normally you grab one of those leaves and you pull on it and it leaves a residue and you can never really get the entire thing off. So here's an example I found on the internet of using a straw and pushing through rather than pulling that stem off of the uh, strawberry. It's a perfect example of overdone action and also inversion, pushing rather than pulling. Here's a really quick example of what I call product cannibalization or harvesting. And it simply illustrates that you don't need to use an entire product to get a useful function. You can remove a piece of the product and solve a useful function. Having now seen a number of examples of recycled design or product repurposing, I wonder what was your reaction? Was it, oh, that's very interesting? Or was it, why didn't I think of that? Or was it, oh, that's obvious? Anyone could have thought of that. Or how about, boy, I wish I was that clever. So if I were then to challenge you to come up with a recycled design on the spot, how would you do it? Well, I'm going to offer a couple of hints and pointers. First of all, let's recognize that there's three basic categories. One situation in which you're given a product or a technology or an artifact that's, let's say, going to be thrown away that you want to recycle. And you have to think of some creative ways to reuse it for a useful purpose. Or you're given a problem or a dilemma, and now you need to find some available resource to solve that problem. The third example is given a problem and a resource, putting them together, adapting and repurposing it to solve a problem. So I'm going to focus on just the second example, because we really studied the first example in the earlier class on resources and enabling technologies. So a couple of helpful tips. We learned about function means trees and functional diagrams, and they actually serve a useful function in this application. Also, enumerating resources, identifying both the ones that are obvious, readily available, and the ones that are derived either by putting different pieces together or perhaps extracting some useful piece from an assembly or from uh, an available resource that I called harvesting earlier. And then third, in a practical setting, identifying existing off-the-shelf products that serve a same or similar function. In other words, not necessarily something that's immediately in front of you, but thinking about something that you could go to Walmart or go to a hardware store or cab store to solve a problem less expensively, more elegantly, and uh, simply. To remind you what I mean by functional block diagram, this is an example that you'd seen before for a go-kart or some kind of vehicle. It's self-explanatory. It has the fundamental components like wheels and windows and steering wheel and how they're interconnected. So if I asked you to improvise or create a makeshift vehicle, now it's your job to think of an alternative object or artifact to use for wheels, an alternative source of uh, power, an alternative uh, passenger compartment or something to sit on. And using that same thought process. There are numerous examples of different kinds of uh, moving machines and vehicles that you might contrive. Reflecting back on that anything that can float boat race that I referenced before, this is really exactly the process that we went through to create our floating machines. We created, whether consciously or subconsciously, a function means tree in our heads. We knew that there needed to be a form of flotation, a form of propulsion, and some means of supporting the passengers. So the flotation could be anything that floats. It could be an uh, inner tube or beer barrel or water bottles or balloons or a bathtub. Um, you get the idea. Here's another example that I encountered a few years ago when a young lady from grade school wanted to build a 
cardiovascular simulator. She had virtually no budget and very limited knowledge of engineering, but wanted something that actually functioned. So without consciously going through this exercise, this is effectively what I did, is I created in my mind um, a functional block diagram. What are the main components that we need in a cardiovascular simulator? Obviously some kind of chamber that represents the heart. It needs a pair of valves to keep the flow going in the right direction. Some means of, of actuating that chamber, power source, and then something to kind of close the loop, a systemic circulation and a way of knowing that it's working, or some kind of pressure gauge. So what could we use from around the lab that we could accomplish these goals without spending any money? Well, the pump chamber, we could use, let's say, a party balloon and perhaps put it inside of a soda bottle so that we would have a means of um, compressing the balloon using external pressure. We can provide pressure by a foot pump or even a syringe. The user would be the power source in this case. The check valve happens to be already built into the foot pump, so we just recycle those. For the systemic circulation, I just use a piece of tubing and a C-clamp to provide a resistance. And for the pressure gauge, the simplest thing was simply a, another tube that was vertically oriented, filled with water. And there you have it, just using around the lab objects to create something that actually works. This is another success story from our capstone design course. This team was challenged to redesign what's called a hug machine, an otherwise uh, expensive device that is used by uh, parents of autistic children to provide what's called hug therapy. So this team used an inflatable air mattress combined with some plywood and other components from Home Depot to create something that could be purchased or could be made at home for about $35 to $40. And this project is now available online for really any parent to, um, to replicate. It's another one of our success stories. Here is kind of the illustration of what they did. There needs to be some means of compressing the body. In the earlier embodiment, it was a pair of, um, of boards. Um, but in um, this student example, it was the uh, inflatable air mattress. There was therefore a need for an air pump and a power source, some way of controlling the air pump, a frame to hold this compressor together, and then um, is an additional feature a headrest. Well, they found that the air mattress provided all of these functions all in one for a very low price. It had a power source, its own air pump, its own control. So all they had to do was build a frame. Um, they got a headrest from uh, a repurposed uh, massage table. And the subjects were actually uh, found on campus. There was a, a display in front of Doherty Hall where student volunteers were asked to try out the hug machine. And as I said, it was a big success and just a very clever illustration of student ingenuity, repurposing low cost solution for what otherwise would be a high tech. One last example of using a function means tree to solve the problem of an affordable solar oven. First, we enumerate and identify and catalog resources, substances, and the fields space, time, information, and functions. This is just a subset. Then we recognize that there are three major functions. We need some source of energy, obviously, then a way of getting the energy from the source into the food, and then some way of holding the food. So for each of those things, we think of the multiple ways that we can accomplish that using off-the-shelf and easily accessible resources. Energy, transmission of energy, 
support of the food. This is part of your homework assignment. So this is maybe just a way of helping you get started. I mentioned before that recycled design doesn't necessarily involve garbage or something that was discarded or useless. It can simply involve something that is off the shelf that's inexpensive because of economy of scale. By way of example, in my lab, we use a number of different kinds of lasers, and they range from thousands of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, in recent years, the phenomenon of these laser pointers that are made in mass quantities that can be purchased for about $4 retail, or if you buy a thousand of them, 50 cents, you can accomplish almost the same thing for a fraction of the cost of a commercial laser. So when it comes time to putting together an experiment in our lab, I first think about using a regular laser pointer to save ourselves thousands of dollars. It's also an enabling technology because creating a consumer product or let's say a product for a third world country that would have been impossible using the tens of thousands of dollar laser is now become possible. And now there are all kinds of new product opportunities that open up due to economy of scale. So the take home message is always think whether there exists a less expensive, less exotic, mass produced product that you can harvest for your application. Here's another perfect example that came out of one of our design teams from the capstone design course. And I thought it was brilliant. It was using a off the shelf mass produced scooter that cost them $200 to retrofit an ordinary inexpensive wheelchair into a motorized wheelchair. And they created a docking station and a way of connecting the two things together to create a, a couple of $100 electric wheelchair that otherwise would cost thousands of dollars. So I wish this team best of success because I would love to see this product on the market to allow people that can't otherwise afford uh, electric wheelchair to have something that is uh, very functional and affordable. I'd like to close on this topic that I find very exciting, which I call do-it-yourself medical devices. And here's an example, the chest master for cystic fibrosis developed by Martin de Vlieger. I'll read his story really quickly. He was diagnosed at an early age with cystic fibrosis. He didn't like being tethered to bulky clinical equipment to help him breathe. With dreams of flying helicopters inspiring him, de Vlieger developed a series of prototypes of a device that would enable him to live the active life he desired using parts found from dumpsters, such as a sewing machine motors, he was able to develop a series of prototypes which enabled him to create a lightweight vest to help him breathe. And here is that prototype. So those of you that know about cystic fibrosis, it builds up mucus within the lungs and it requires that your chest or your back is uh, percussed or beaten on to loosen that, uh, that mucus. And this is obviously a type of um, uh, solenoid actuator that does that vibration automatically. And you've got to really hand it to him for his ingenuity. One more example. Here's another example that I will read to you. It involves an aortic valve patch from Marfan syndrome developed by this gentleman, Tal Goldsworthy, a boiler engineer. He was diagnosed with an aortic valve defect. And this was in the early 2000s when the treatment was replacing a part of the aorta with a graft or a valve. He found inspiration in his backyard. He observed that a garden hose had a bulging section or leak that could be repaired using a waterproof adhesive tape. It's very much like an aneurysm in your aorta. So he was resourceful enough to get some medical collaborators to perform uh, an MRI and CT image of his chest so that he could create a 3D CAD model of his own aorta. He then used 3D printing to create a replica and enlisted some other engineers to create a textile aortic sleeve that custom fit the outside of his aorta. It was made out of polyethylene terephthalate, PET. And when the time came to do clinical trials, he was himself the first human subject. Fast forward, he's now has started a company 
and more than 40 other patients have received a personalized version of this device as of November of 2013. So this is really astonishing and yet I believe the future of medicine. I think that patients will be getting involved in their own personalized care in a more meaningful way, especially in under-resourced areas. And it's something I'd really like to promote. And it all relates back to this theme of repurposing and reusing and recycling um, lower cost alternatives. One last example of a do-it-yourself medical device, a foot-controlled wheelchair. It was developed by a gentleman whose son was unable to use his motorized wheelchair because of lack of motor function in his upper body. So he retrofit a wheelchair that he bought on eBay that originally had a joystick by being, having been inspired by once unsuccessfully repairing a digital scale. He uh, 